Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. And that's good. So good day to everybody. I use the Australian uh, daytime independent welcome. And I would like to welcome you all to stream B or session B in this eighth conference of uh, iCare. And uh, we have a tight program. I think we have 15 minutes for every presentation, present for every presentation. but we lost uh, one speaker. So I think the best thing is we move up the last speaker by one slot, and then we have a couple of minutes more time for discussion and comments. But I would basically suggest that we first have the speaker present the 15 minutes, and we have all three speakers who are present presenting, and then uh, maybe have discussion at the very end. Of all the papers or in some sequence, we'll see how the, uh, the response will be. Now I have seen, or oh, a bit difficult because I have only a, a list of the uh, co-authors for the papers. I see Ernest Bikimirov uh, is here, our first speaker is here. Uh, for the second speaker, I'm not quite sure who's around, you know, there's a list of Matthias Feld, Wagner, Eduardo Schuster. There are one of these people around, maybe raise his or her hand. And our third speaker, Anastasia Velkina, uh, she's around, I see her. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Ah, that's great. So we have got Matteo Feld or Eduardo Schuster. Okay, maybe he or she will drop in a bit later. So I would like to open the session and pass on the word for the presentation to Ernest. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So my name is Ernest Bektimirov, and the title of the paper that I'm going to present today is Relation Between News Media Sentiment and Housing Prices, uh, Cross-Country Analysis. And this paper is co-authored with my colleagues, Tatiana Sokolik and Anthony Ayansa, and we are all from Brock University, Canada. So let me begin my presentation with a brief overview. So I will start with motivation for our study, and then I will continue with the data and methodology that we use in our empirical paper. Then I will talk about main results. Our paper is still work in progress, but I will still be able to present some results. And at the conclusion, I will, I will present some summary and contribution of our study. So let me start with motivation. Uh, this past January, January this year, The Economist magazine, they devoted the whole issue to the housing markets across the world. And this attention to the housing market, it's not surprising given that housing market represents uh, the important sector of any developed economy. And also, if we look from the personal point of view, even uh, for many of us, actually for many individuals, uh, purchase of the house is usually the most significant financial decision that we have to make during our lifetime. And housing prices have not been stable. So just recall the financial crisis where we had the collapse of the housing market. Since then, the housing market rebounded, and now there is even some concerns about new bubbles in the housing market in some countries. So given the importance of the housing market, it receives significant attention in the academic literature. And researchers have tried to predict, to identify what factors can help us predict housing prices. And traditionally, attention has been paid to so-called economic fundamentals like interest rates, unemployment, economic growth, and the number of new houses that are built in the area. But recently, there were several studies published that focus on US and United Kingdom housing market, and they looked at the role of news media sentiment as a predictive factor in order to predict housing prices. 
And what they found that news media sentiment can provide predictive power of the future housing prices beyond the power that can be provided by economic, econo economic fundamentals and also by past historical housing prices. So our study contribute to this stream of literature. So we decided to examine, so if previous studies focus just on one market, our study focuses on two markets, on housing markets in Canada and Australia. And uh, so we, so this is one of the goals of our study to consider two new markets and to provide cross country comparative analysis. But the major goal of our study to extend the textual analysis because traditionally previous papers, they use only dictionary based textual analysis. In our paper, in addition to the dictionary based textual analysis, we also use structural topic modeling that allows us to identify what topic, what specific topics uh, can have predictive power regarding the future housing prices. So why did we decide to choose Canada and Australia besides that these markets have not been examined yet? There are two major reasons. One major reason because English is an official language in both countries. So that's why all methodology regarding the textual analysis that we develop for examining one market can be easily transmitted to examining the market in, in the other country. And another major reason, because these markets are not the same. There are some significant difference in terms of the structure. Like for example, in Australian housing market, they use extensively used auctions. There are also larger land transfer taxes compared to Canadian housing market. And also there are significant differences in terms of regulatory environment. Uh, simply put, the Australian housing market uh, has a high transparency and also the high regulation due to the high consumer protection laws. So how do we conduct our study? So because we conduct textual analysis, so we identified major cities, eight major cities for Canada and Australia. Eight Australian cities, they're all capitals of state and, and territories in Australia. And for each city, we identified one or two major local newspapers. Our study period is from 2004 up to 2019. And we collected newspaper articles that discuss real estate and housing market. And overall, we collected over 10,000 articles for Canadian housing market and over 11,000 articles for Australian housing market. And then we measure sentiment. So first we use dictionary-based textual analysis in order to compute sentiment. The way it's done, we compute the positive and negative words. And uh, you can see the formula and then so we calculate the difference between the positive and negative, negative words and we divide it by the total words. So this is one of the ways how we calculate sentiment. We use some other additional proxies for the sentiment as a robustness check. In order to identify positive and negative words, we use Harvard for psychological dictionary that was expanded by Sue in her review of financial study paper that was published in 2018. And while she was extending this, she adjusted the psychological dictionary for financial domain. As a robustness check, we also use another dictionary that was proposed by Logan and McDonald in 2011. Just to give you some grief overview what kind of the words are used in these dictionaries. So in this table, this table shows top 20 most frequently occurring positive and negative words in Canadian newspaper articles regarding real estate. And uh, if we look at the positive words, so it's uh, what we could expect like up, increase, high, rise, growth. If we look at the negative words is down, low, decline. If we look a little bit down, we can see the words like recession, bubble, shortage. So this is the negative word that have been incorporated specifically to be relevant to financial domain. So does our sentiment, can it capture the, the expectations about future housing prices? One way to observe it more or less directly to compare it with the consumer survey. Specifically for the last four years, starting from the second quarter of 2016, 
Bank of Canada conducts survey, quarterly survey of households in Canada. And one of the questions which is asked in this survey, what is your expectations about future housing prices? And so this is blue dotted line. It shows the basically students response. So uh, over the last four years, uh, Canadian residents expect that housing prices next quarter will be going up on average by four and a half percent. And now the red line, it shows the sentiment which is computed from the local uh, from the newspaper articles and you can see that this red line it basically moves in parallel more or less uh, with the actual responses of Canadian residents and correlation coefficient is 0.53 between these two lines so this is one of the justification for the consumer uh, for the sentiment that we compute so it shows that it it basically more or less reflects student opinions, uh, people's opinions about future housing prices. And then we run a set of uh, panel regressions. And like in the first set of regressions, we try to predict future housing prices simply by looking at the past, in the change of the past housing prices for the last four quarters. Of course, uh, uh, so all of these coefficients are significant. R square is about 40%, 39%. Then we extend the model with economic fundamentals. I, I didn't put all the, uh, if, uh, what kind of economic fundamentals we are using? We use as unemployment, mortgage rate. And, but the most interesting set of regressions where we add our sentiment indexes. And you can see that uh, for the for first three lakhs, for the first three legs or the first three quarters. So they're all significant, highly significant at 1% level. So basically what does it show? It shows that sentiment can provide predictive power beyond the one which has been provided by the previous housing prices and also economic fundamentals. So basically the same conclusion has been uh, May arrived arrived by the researchers who looked at the UK housing market and US housing market. So basically, we now reach the same conclusion in the context of the of the Canadian housing market. If we do the same analysis for Australian data, so let me show you the last regression. So here results are different. So here sentiment is not statistically significant. So for Australian housing market sentiment index does not provide additional predictive power that beyond the pre previous housing prices and beyond the economic fundamentals. So this is one of the difference if we try to look at the two countries. And, and as I said, one of the largest extension of our study uh, beyond the traditional textual analysis that uses dictionary based approach, we also use topic modeling. So specifically for, for, for those uh, who are not familiar with to topic modeling, the way topic modeling is working. So we look at the old documents and then we try to identify what are the, what words tend to come up together in this type of documents. Like in our case, this is in newspaper articles. And then by observing words, we can make conclusions about what the underlying topics beyond this, uh, uh, beyond these words that uh, that come that can come from these documents. So let me show you the results. So for Canadian housing market, so based on the Canadian newspaper article, they talk about housing market. We identified six distinct topics like economic outlook, government policy, construction housing affordability, real estate agents, and housing sales activity. So this is the list of the uh, 20 words for each of the topic. We conducted the same analysis for Australian data. And this is another difference uh, from the Canadian housing market. For Australian data, we identified three additional topics, commercial real estate, credit market, and auction. So these topics were not present in the, in the Canadian data. And, and then we run the set of regressions, but now we run these regressions on each individual topic. So for Canada, we have six distinct topics. And what we found uh, that uh, second lag, 
for uh, of ec economy outlook and the first lap in the very right uh, in the regression seven for the housing sales activity are statistically significant so based on this analysis we can conclude among the all the topics that we identified that show up in the in newspaper articles economy outlook and housing sales activity have predictive power for future housing prices so this is where we are, our research stands right now so we are right now in the process of conducting the same type of analysis for australian housing market it has not been finished yet so let me briefly summarize what are our main results so we found that media sentiment has significant predictive power for Canadian housing prices, but not so much in, for, in the Australian housing market. And also we identified differences in terms of the topic related to the housing market in Canada and Australia, like specifically for Australia, we identified three additional topics, commercial real estate, credit market, and auctions. And uh, when we look at the topics for Canadian housing market, economic outlook and housing sales activity specifically have predictive power for future housing prices. In terms of the contribution, so our study provides the first examination of the housing markets and on relationship between the housing markets and sentiment outside of the United States and United Kingdom. But the most importantly, we extend dictionary-based textual analysis with topic modeling that allows us to identify the topics and to examine the predictive ability of each individual topics. And we believe that our research will not have only academic contributions, but also have significant practical applications for policy makers, land developers, and also individual households. Because at the end, as I mentioned earlier, basically for almost for every person, the the decision to purchase a house is the main financial decision that they have to make during their lifetime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernest, for your talk and presentation. And I noted in the meantime, uh, Wagner Eduardo Schuster has joined us. Is he around? I've seen his. Are you around? Yeah, hello, hello, I'm, I'm hello. Wagner. I'm here, and here in Mat me and Mateus are going to present. Okay. Hi. Can you share the screen? Yes, for sure. Just a second. Okay. Okay, it seems to work. I can see your screen. So, welcome to both of you. And uh, so, this is Matthias Feld, as the presenter of the paper on the effect of macroeconomic variables on bank support. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jürgen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And uh... We, are re we, re we really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all today on iCare. And uh, so let's start. Uh, here is our work. Uh, me and Wagner studied the effects of macroeconomic variables on bank default um, using a financial institution in Brazil as our case study. So uh, let me start by making this full screen, just a second. Okay, it's not, it's not working, but let's do it like this. Uh, so, uh, on recent years, uh, Brazil faced a very hard economic recession, right? From 2014 to, to 2016. And in 2017, a very slow recovery was starting. We had a 1% GDP growth in 2019, which is not much, but it was already a slow recovery. However, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, hit hard in Brazil, as well as in many other countries, and we uh, that gradual recovery was lost. And among many of the 
uh, highly affected uh, variables, economic variables affected by uncertainty uh, among econo the uh, economic recovery are credit financing and default. So we believe that credit quality is very important and credit will be an important factor for the economic recovery, especially for small business and medium business that will need credit to keep their operations and also sustain the maintenance of jobs. Therefore, uh, it's really important to understand how the macroeconomic environment can affect uh, default behavior. So here we can start talking ab ab about uh, our model. It's a very simple vector error correction model. And here are the data we use to study this relationship. We use data from January 2014 and to April 2019. And our dependent variables, which are represented in the equation by xt and xt minus one, uh, are the the dependent variables are the credit products we we, we use from from data of a commercial bank in southern Brazil, and uh, we calculated the default levels of six different credit products, both for firms and households. So for firms, we use we used loan renegotiations and working capital, the default levels of these products. And for households, we use renegotiations, payroll deduction loans, and overdrafts. Uh, as for the independent variables on the model, which are represented by ZT and ZT minus P, uh, these were obtained from, from public data, and these are our uh, macroeconomic variables. So we had we used six macroeconomic variables: the economic activity index, the basic national interest rate, inflation, construction costs index, unemployment, and uh, income commitment. Oh, okay. Now, now you went. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so our, our model is a time series, a vector error correction model. We use the traditional tests and treatment. Uh, for example, we tested for stationarity using ADF and Philips Peron. Co-integration was confirmed by Johansson's test. We will see the results later. We treated a few outliers uh, with some dummy variables, which we can see here is the D in our model and uh, just finishing here uh, alpha is the adjustment speed b is the beta beta is the co-integrate the co-integrating vector and uh, e naturally is the 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 error term so a few outliers were treated with the dumb variables and the, the identification of the ideal level of lags for the endogenous endogenous variables was used with the traditional order selection criteria. Uh, and continuing with the methodology, uh, first, we, we wanted to see how the model will behave only with the endogenous variables. So uh, we wanted to see how the model would improve when we added the exogenous macroeconomic variables. So first, we ran a preliminary regression with uh, only the endogenous variables. And we had uh, several non-significant parameters and a very low R square. However, when we included the exogenous variables as per our expectations, uh, the model improved drastically. So we used Pearson's correlations and Granger causality tests to determine the inclusion and ordering of the variables in the model, which is an essential step for vector error correction models. And we simulated different models in order to seek the best adjustment, uh, considering statistical significance, economic sense, and R square. So for the model results, we can see that we had a total of six co-integrations and it passed all robustness tests. So normality, autocorrelation, heteroscedasticity, uh, and stability. Now, going to the general results, uh, 
what we could see was that different credit products responded differently to each of the macroeconomic variables, which is interesting because when we studied the literature, many of the other research we found you, uh, used to use the, generally they use some default index, some general national default index to analyze this kind of relationship. But when we, when we take data from a specific institution and do a case study like this, we can see unique effects on each type of consumer, for example, firms or households. And uh, so part of our findings are in line with others in the literature, but we also found some surprising results for a few relationships. So let's take a look at them. So starting with the effects of the interest rate. For the interest rate, we found a positive effect on default for firms and households, renegotiations and working capital, which is expected. And we also found similar results to the literature. Uh, sure, you expect that the interest rate will have a positive effect on default, right? However, we also found a negative effect for payroll deduction loans and overdrafts. And this was against our expectations. Uh, for pay low, payroll deduction loans, we actually did not expect very much clear effects because these products are contracted under fixed rates when they are hired. So they shouldn't be that much affected anyway by a floating interest rate. However, for overdrafts, this is an interesting result. Uh, why would the interest rates cause a positive effect on the default of overdrafts? Well, we thought about an hypothesis that should be further investigated, that it is possible that increases in the interest rates, which are usually highly correlated with the rates of private overdrafts, it is possible then that uh, increases in the interest rates could create incentives for consumers to prioritize the payment of this high cost debt, since, uh, as we will see uh, soon, uh, overdrafts are very, very easily accessible, at least here in Brazil. And sometimes they are hired even out automatically uh, on, the, on the consumer's bank account. So maybe if consumers uh, see that this cost is rising too much, maybe they prioritize the payment of this high debt. But of course, again, this should be further investigated. These are just preliminary results. As for the economic activity index, we found a negative effect on default for renegotiations, payroll deduction loans and working capital for firms and households, which is also uh, expected. I mean, if the economic activity is improving, so uh, consumers and companies' capacity of paying their debts should also be improving. But again, uh, for overdrafts, which we see that it's a complex product with unique characteristics, we, we found a negative, uh, uh, sorry, a positive effect, which is also unexpected. And we, we brought another possibility considering the ease of access to this product, uh, that is possible that in a scenario of growing activity, uh, maybe consumers are spending too much and maybe there is a lot of consumptions and expenses and they are expanding more than they can, resulting in an increase in overdraft use. So that is another possibility. And uh, of course, we should focus on overdraft use for future works. As for inflation, uh, according to the literature, we expected a twofold effect. Summer and Shana Zarian, I hope I'm saying that correctly they bring uh, a twofold effect for inflation. They, they describe that a, a positive effect on default can be expected from inflation uh, if an, uh, inflation happens on the prices of production factors, which will tend to increase firms' costs and thus resulting in a less capacity of owning with their debts, honoring their debts. This will then increase in default. And this was actually what we found for working capital, indicating that the firms contracting this product uh, suffered from this, what, which we call effect one, and not from what we call 
uh, effect two, which is the possible negative effect of inflation on default. Uh, this negative effect could come if inflation happens on the final product prices of companies instead of the prices of production factors, because an increase in final product prices could lead to higher revenues for firms, thus improving credit quality and their capacity to pay their debts. And that channel of effect will decrease default levels. And this was actually found for renegotiations of firms. So as per Sommer and Shah Nazarian, uh, the twofold effect depends a lot on market structure. And so inflation is also uh, a variable that has complex effects, as we can see. Finally, for households inflation, uh, we found a positive effect on payroll deduction loans, which is expected since uh, if inflation is rising and uh, families have uh, a lower budget, then uh, we should expect default to increase. But for renegotiations and overdrafts, we found a negative effect of inflation on their default. And as Jakubik mentions, this seems to be the case that uh, default behavior then depends on real interest rates and not nominal interest rates. So this could be a channel of effect for uh, inflation, as he also finds uh, negative effects of, inf of inflation on default. So to conclude a bit of what we learned with this study, uh, first, we just want to mention that we didn't bring the results of uh, the unemployment and income commitment variables, as the model results were not very clear there was a lot of uh, alternating effects between uh, legs, between each legs of these variables and also each product. So as the results were not very clear, we should further investigate them uh, as long, uh, sorry, as well as the overdraft credit products. So this is in line for our future work. And to conclude, uh, uh, 2020 started uh, with a lot of uncertainty in many countries because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we see the supply and use of credit as an important instrument to resume growth and as a leverage for investment and consumption. And uh, default behavior we can see does not follow a unique pattern. So this is an interesting contribution from our work. Uh, this, this brings the importance of case studies like this, uh, instead of using generalized uh, default indexes as dependent variable, for example. So we encourage uh, work similar to this uh, being made in other countries and with other financial institutions and banks, fintechs, any kind of financial institutions that can offer credit. Because uh, if we have further confirmation of our, result, our results, then financial institutions can use this evidence to develop strategies for sales, credit sales, risk control, and the anticipation of defaulting consumers' behavior. And uh, the public sector, of course, must maintain a healthy and stable macroeconomic environment so that uh, credit supply can maintain responsible, especially for small and medium business. Uh, that's it for now. I guess we don't have time for questions, but you can email us. And uh, we thank you for the opportunity again. And спасибо. <laughs> thank you, Matthias. And uh, just because you may not have got this information at the beginning when I missed you, uh, we have one speaker less, you know, so we have to move, or we will move on forward. So I thought we have three talks, you know, and then we we'll use the third, uh, the, the fourth slot for some discussion. So you may get some discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay, now thank you once again, and uh, I think we should move on. And uh, we, our next speaker in the row would be Anastasia Zelkina. Hello. Hey, hello. I will share my screen in a bit.
Okay. So, uh, is it visible? Yes. No, no, not yet. Not yet. Now it is. Now it is. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, good day, everyone. Once again, uh, I'd like to share my research uh, regarding uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, travel demand and uh, its uh, determinants uh, within uh, the dynamic time series uh, modeling, uh, namely within uh, the ARDL model. Uh, so, the structure of my uh, presentation is uh, the following. You can see it on this slide. Um, so to make an introduction uh, to my uh, research, I'd like uh, to uh, start with the fact that US, uh, uh, the US has had uh, uh, the biggest domestic air travel market uh, from the very birth of, uh, the of the commercial aviation industry until April 2020. So the recent decline had to do uh, with uh, the outbreak of the coronavirus and uh, the uh, subsequent release of the guidelines, which uh, prescribed uh, everyone to stay home. Uh, that is why uh, the uh, amount of air traffic uh, decreased uh, dramatically. Uh, and uh, China became uh, the leader in this field. Uh, right. However, uh, the US uh, air travel... Sorry? Sorry, are there any questions? I can't hear you. Could you repeat? Sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to repeat. I suggest postponing questions to the end of the talk, whoever it was who marched in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, uh, so uh, despite all that, uh, the US air travel market is uh, still one of uh, the biggest in the world, and uh, it is not evident uh, whether the China whether China will uh, be able to retain its uh, position after the end of the pandemic. Uh, that is why it is uh, important to investigate uh, the main driving forces uh, behind the U.S. air passenger traffic growth. Uh, so despite the fact uh, that uh, uh, a decent amount of literature has been accumulated so far uh, on the U.S. Uh, air travel market, uh, relative, relatively little attention uh, has been paid to dynamic time series modeling. Uh, there are only uh, three uh, multivariate dynamic models that deal with uh, aggregate uh, domestic um, air traffic in the US and that to use the configuration analysis. Uh, you can see them on the slide. Uh, however, uh, there, um, there are plenty of other papers that deal with uh, microscopic data. Um, or the so-called origin destination type of data or um, the deal with um, aggregate data but in relation to a specific area for example uh, in relation to Hawaiian traffic or, or international air traffic but not in the uh, in the relation uh, to uh, domestic air traffic uh, uh, so that is why uh, further research involving multiple variables uh, within this approach is rather timely uh, for the US uh, uh, aviation industry. Uh, so on this slide uh, you can see uh, the variables uh, that uh, were used uh, uh, in this research. Uh, so as a dependent variable I used the revenue passenger miles. Uh, one revenue passenger mile uh, means uh, one uh, paying passenger transported one mile. Uh, and uh, as for my independent variables, I used some um, a number of uh, standard variables uh, that are uh, widely used for aviation research, such as uh, airfare, uh, income, uh, uh, inflation measured through uh, consumer price index and the population. Uh, but I also incorporated uh, one um, new factor, uh, which uh, uh, has uh, never been um, uh, introduced uh, in uh, such models before, uh, namely S&P 500 index. Um, some of, um, so the majority of uh, my time series uh, uh, already uh, included a seasonal adjustment and uh, those that um, were not seasonal adjusted, I uh, uh, applied this uh, procedure uh, to them as well. Uh, the time span that um, was um, included in uh, my analysis is uh, from uh, January uh, 2000 to February 2020. Uh, 
um, <clears throat> now let's move on uh, to the methodology. Uh, so to conduct this research, an ultra-aggressive uh, distributed lab model was uh, employed. Uh, some of the most um, obvious advantages of uh, this uh, um, estimation approach uh, uh, are that uh, it allows us uh, to incorporate uh, both the short run and the long run uh, dynamics and also it allows us to use uh, um, variables that are uh, integrated of uh, orders uh, zero and one uh, simultaneously. Um, and uh, thirdly, uh, it allows us uh, to avoid um, problems uh, related to autocorrelation and uh, endogeneity uh, by selecting an appropriate uh, number of legs for each variable. Uh, so this uh, estimation uh, procedure involves uh, several stages, uh, namely uh, unit root and the uh, contribution testing, uh, then uh, estimation of um, short run and the long run coefficients, and uh, finally diagnostic testing. Uh, so here you can see uh, the first two stages, um, stage narrative testing and and the co-integration testing. So to uh, check uh, stationary properties of uh, my data, I use the two unit root tests that correct uh, for uh, structural breaks, uh, parent uh, unit root test and the zero tenders unit root test. Uh, so both tests uh, yielded uh, the same results, namely that uh, income uh, is uh, uh, stationary levels and uh, all the other variables are stationary after uh, taking uh, the first difference. So um uh we can um therefore say that uh, none of the variables uh, is integrated uh, of order two and uh, that's why we can apply the rdl procedure uh as for the integration analysis uh i um carried out a bound testing approach. And uh, according to uh, its results, so the null hypothesis of no co-integration um, can be rejected at all levels of significance, uh, which means that uh, um, our variables are co-integrated and uh, we can uh, proceed uh, to estimate the uh, short run and the long run coefficients. Uh, so on this slide, uh, you can see uh, the main um, estimation results. Uh, so from the long run coefficients, um, air, air fares and uh, inflation uh, have uh, a negative impact uh, on uh, domestic air travel in the US, whereas uh, in um, income uh, S&P uh, 500 index and the population uh, exercise a, a positive impact on it. Uh, however, it should be noted that uh, only uh, two variables uh, were statistically significant, uh, namely airfare and uh, S&P 500. Uh, they were statistically significant uh, in the long run. Uh, as uh, for the short run um, coefficients, the main uh, determinants of uh, the US air traffic uh, in the short run are income, S&P uh, 500, and the previous values of uh, uh, revenue passenger miles itself. Um, the error correction term uh, turned out to be negative and uh, highly significant, which means that uh, um, our variables are indeed uh, co-integrated. Uh, uh, its estimate uh, is uh, uh, minus 0 0.089, uh, which means that 8.9% uh, of the adjustment uh, towards uh, the long run equilibrium takes place in a month, or that, uh, in other words, uh, any exogenous uh, shocks are corrected in about 11.2 months. Uh, so, as for the statistical appropriateness of, um, oh, sorry, as for the statistical appropriateness uh, of um, our model, um, uh, it can be uh, inferred that uh, it is uh, free from uh, serial correlation at 5% at five percent significance level. Uh, it uh, has uh, homoscedastic normally distributed residuals and uh, is uh, correctly specified. Uh, it's, uh, it, it should be also noted that uh, its uh, parameters are uh, stable over time according uh, to uh, Kutsum and the Kutsum squared statistics. Um, so um, to conclude, I'd like uh, uh, to say that uh, um, in the long run, um, greater air mobility in the US uh, is uh, associated with uh, higher levels of uh, S&P 500 index and uh, 
uh, decreasing efforts. Uh, in short run, uh, the most available predictors for domestic air traffic are income, S&P 500, and the previous values of uh, RPM. And uh, according to our model, the adjustment uh, towards uh, the long run equilibrium uh, takes place uh, uh, in about uh, 11 months. So, uh, as informed uh, by um, these uh, findings, uh, it can be recommended that uh, policymakers should put a special emphasis on airfares and uh, S&P 500 for uh, forecasting long-term air traffic in the US, which can be useful, for example, while deciding on the further expansion of their transportation network, or for example, on uh, uh, possible investment in the existing airports. And uh, these findings may also be useful for practitioners uh, that deal with airlines uh, in a B2B context. Namely, um, this model uh, would allow them uh, to accurately assess the impact uh, of uh, the current economic situation on a travel demand and uh, consequently uh, on the demand of uh, their own goods and the services. So um, thank you for your attention. Um, so these uh, are short run coefficients, just in case. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, unexpectedly, at least to me, we have now about 10 to 15 minutes time for a little bit of discussion and comments. And uh, because I had to do that, uh, organize it spontaneously, what I would suggest is we open the floor for one paper after the other. If it's running more than five minutes in the discussion, I make sure that the others get a chance to come in too. And whenever we have a question, we may give the author first the chance and invite her to question. That's my suggestion for future. And uh, our first speaker, Ernest uh, Batkimiro, uh, had a, a paper basically on demand and supply with some new instruments or new data uh, from a newspaper uh, selected um, indices of uh, media sentiment as he calls it. Are there any comments or questions in the audience? To... If, if I may. Of course. Yeah. Of, of... Yeah, now, now we have established that you can hear me as well because yes, it's a diff different. <laughs> Good. Uh, I, I, I found all the three presentations very interesting, um, and uh, I might have questions to the two other papers as well. But to the first paper, I was very much intrigued to know, apart from the difference in the topics that you have discussed with regards to what was covered in the newspapers and which topics have the most impact on uh, uh, house prices, um, did you? think or did you investigate maybe there can be some cultural differences between Australians and, and Canadians? Maybe they react differently to the sentiment in... Uh, because the first, the, first, the first impression from the first two regressions was that Australia doesn't react to sentiment and Canada does react to sentiment. Then you went towards disentangling the topics and I wonder maybe there can be something cultural. Can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, yeah, maybe there is something cultural we don't know yet, and uh, but there are still significant differences between the two markets because, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, Australian housing market is more heavily regulated. Like, for example, uh, in Canada, a real estate agent can represent both buyer and seller in the same transaction. It's not allowed in, in Australia. So uh, Australian housing market is more heavily regulated. And also, the, uh, another thing that, again, I, we reside in Canada, when we are doing this research, we find out that in Australia, they use auctions in order to sell houses. So on Saturdays, people get to, uh, people go to this house, it will be for sale. It never happens. I have never seen anything like that in Canada. Uh, so, so, so we don't know exactly. So there are some other significant, yeah, probably there are maybe cultural differences. But there are also probably there are some structural differences in the way the market operates. Uh, it's possible, but uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's it, it's it's a good comment. Yes, yeah, so thank you for your comment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, the only thing I don't know how we can address it. Uh, yeah, how we can see if there is a culture. Uh, of course, we, uh, we can. 
There may be something in the topics. I didn't quite analyze because I have a number of topics, but maybe if you check which of the topics trigger some reaction in what direction, and then you probably would, because well, regulation is a good point, because regulation probably removes uh, the, the, the vast majority of the effects. But uh, since there is some effect and of some topics, uh, I would try to explore it a little bit more. It would be very interesting to see what exactly drives the, the response to, to media reports. No, 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 definitely. Yeah. And this is what we are trying, uh, what we're thinking of the benefit of the topic modeling is because we can identify specific topics and we can measure the predictive ability of each individual topics. And, and this is what we are working right now on Canadian, on Australian data. Yes, right now. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Quick question. Are there any other questions regarding the paper of Anna? That's not the case, and I would suggest to move on, you know, because we're run, running late if we give everyone five minutes. And the second paper is the second presentation by uh, Matthäus. Uh, are there any questions, comments, remarks on the what you? Is it? <laughs> Go ahead. You seem to be well prepared. <laughs> Uh, well, it's uh, well. Maybe, maybe <laughs> there was a reason why I put these three papers together. <laughs> you <laughs> so had I have prior, questions. You had prior information. I yeah, yeah, Matthias, I, 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 uh, I, I liked the. Uh, I think that the title of the paper is a bit misleading because the title says the bank defaults, and it is not a bank defaults. It's about loan defaults that you you consider. So that's why that's why the paper is in the consumer behavior session. Uh, uh, and it was very interesting to see that consumer behavior in terms of like default and decision to repay to the bank or not to repay to the bank or feasibility of repayment to the bank depends on macroeconomic variables. Some of them are not surprising, obviously, but what I liked uh, and, and I, what I would like to know more a little bit about is the renegotiation stage when you discussed uh, how likely it is that the customer and the bank will uh, enter into renegotiation phase in terms of like uh, the conditions of the mortgage or maybe extending the repayment deadline. Uh, maybe I missed something on that. If you, if you could expand on that a little bit, uh, the, my, my question is how, would, how did you, how would you, whether you were thinking about it, about the role of the bank in this process? Because the other decisions in your model are the decisions of the customer, whether the customer can or whether the customer wants to repay. And negotiation is the bilateral process. There are two parties and the bank is also affected. So maybe the, some of the unusual signs in terms of inflation impact, for example, if I remember well, may be explained by the fact that the bank is not willing to negotiate. I can't actually see him on the, on the list because I don't have all pictures. Matthias, what's your reply? Mm. So then maybe I was speaking. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, actually, I agreed as well. If, if he's not around, you know, so he has to suffer the fact to get some comments. I thought this, this paper was not really focused in the sense, you know, that he had two different, too many different kind of indicators of default or distress, I would rather call it, for consumers. Yes. But of course, if you have overdrafts and compare it to actually defaulting, this seems to me completely different animals, so to speak in terms of consumer stress. It seems to me it's more likely, you know, that you get increase in overdraft before you get bankrupt, you know, or you keep up uh, paying back on, on other kind of uh, credit uh, instruments. So anyway, it's a pity that he's not around, but I guess this is something- Yeah, he has, he has missed something. <laughs> I think so too. Uh, then may I just, because since I'm on the topic, I will ask my last question and I will yes. uh, move then to another, if we have time to go to another we session. Probably should, absolutely, we should have time for. And, 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 and as Cecilia also mentioned, the, uh, uh, some factors that are pretty uh, expected, I would say the relationship between the price and the demand is something we would expect to be negative. But what I found particularly interesting was the macroeconomic factor, which was in the stock market index. Yes. And I wanted to know more about it. So that, that links to the previous paper. Uh, uh, what does this index represent? Is it more about the uh, general economic conditions? Is this the business cycle idea? So why would you, how would you explain the stock market index uh, affects uh, air travel? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you for your question. So uh, the idea behind uh, introducing this variable was to assess uh, the business climate uh, in the US and uh, uh, in, mm, uh, in uh, other indexes, uh, indices were previously used in other papers. Um, such as NASDAQ, for example, and uh, they were uh, used to, to um, assess uh, the, uh, the demand for air travel um, on behalf of business travelers, uh, whereas uh, income was used to, to assess uh, air travel demand, air travel demand uh, uh, from uh, leisure travelers. So. Okay, thank you. So maybe it would make sense. Did you try the regression separately, income separately, uh, since they represent similar factors? Just to 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 move. Well, but that's 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 rather a technicality. Thank you. And now I, I understand the idea. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to add one comment because you started out with the right observation that the airline business is in decline at the moment, but for different reasons, of course. And whether they recover or not, maybe of course relating to variables which you did not consider at this stage. It means travel restrictions, possibilities to go on holidays, etc., you know, which are now completely out of the picture. You just look at the income price situation. Could you hear me? No, sorry, I can barely hear you. Could you type your question? Hi. Because the quality is uh, really poor, I, I, can't, I can barely hear you. I'm sorry, I, I have to find out where I type it. <laughs> I guess this will probably take in the it. chat. So it's in the chat. But if it's possible. Well, it's not a, well, the thing it's more a comment than a one line question. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wanted to say you started your presentation with the relation to the COVID crisis which you face at the moment. Yes. And of course, if you want to get an idea how things might take up again or not after the crisis, I guess it's not enough to look just at income and uh, wealth indicators like uh, stock market indices, etc. Maybe important to note as well what kind of uh, restrictions there are to travel due to the crisis to the health crisis. Yes, thank you okay. for your idea. I will try to incorporate it into my model. That's the, that's the immediate idea which came to my mind. Now mm -hmm. I think we, have, we essentially reached the end of our one hour slot, you know, and uh, I would like to thank all of you who uh, presented in particular and who took part in uh, as an audience and in discussion. And I would close the session here. We probably have all to move now back to screen A. Thank you. I have one comment for Anastasia, if she is interested. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, Anastasia. Yeah, because you're using SP500, and SP500, it's a leading economic indicator. So simply uh, just one of the idea, you may want to look at other econo leading economic indicators. Uh, and uh, like, uh, for example, is uh, leading, it will be like housing, uh, it will, uh, because stock market is one of them, there is another manufacturing activity, invent retail sales. So you may try to other leading economic indicators. Or the other, also you can try current economic indicators like unemployment rate, GDP inflation rate. So, so this is something. I use the inflation. I, I use the inflation. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I also tried to run um, other regressions, including consumer debt. Oh, okay. Any other comments? I didn't want yes, to. Yes, but thank you for your suggestion. Approach. Yeah, sure. Any further comments? Don't want to cut anyone off. But if that's no. not the case, because we have to switch uh, channels, basically, I would uh, suggest to close this session here and we all move. I hope to see you again in screen eight. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the fourth presenter, and I'm pretty sure the second presenter will join us very soon. So I suggest we're not waiting any, any longer.
We have 12 participants now in this session. I'm very happy to welcome you all here in this session that uh, we labeled as inflation expectations, but it will not be only on inflation expectations. It will be also about uh, more general economic expectations and perceptions. And as uh, was clear in the keynote, it's impossible to avoid talking about uh, COVID-19. And perhaps the very first presentation is mentioning COVID and the second presentation will be mentioning COVID. So we are sort of continuing discussion that uh, Michael Kurta has started in his keynote um, speech. Lena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to participate in this conference and uh, to everybody for joining. So um, the paper I'm presenting today is um, still very new, so any comments will be um, greatly welcome. And it's joint work with uh, Chung Bui and Ben Hayu, both at the uh, University of Marburg, and uh, Zhang Nie, who is uh, with me at uh, Leibniz University Hanover. And as you can see from the title, this is about consumer sentiment during um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, as we are all aware, and uh, as was discussed also in, in the keynote just now, um, the, this ongoing pandemic has uh, represented a huge economic shock in, in several um, regards. There's this uncertainty aspect, of course, and um, then the interesting fact that uh, we had a demand and supply shock happening at the same time. And uh, what's also very important um, and new in, um, re with regard to other previous economic crises is that we have kind of now this trade off between health policy measures on the one hand, which help us to fight the pandemic and the virus, but then um, the economic trade off um, of these lockdown measures um, for, for the um, economy and uh, things like uh, trade and production and uh, labor market outcomes. So um, uh, it's interesting to check how this affects consumer sentiment. And that's what we're trying to do in, in this paper, where we conducted an online survey on households uh, in Vietnam and Thailand in early May this year, which in those two countries was shortly after the end of the lockdown period or in, during the first easing phase of uh, lockdown measures. And what we did in our survey was um, uh, on top of asking uh, a number of questions, measuring sentiment, but also other macroeconomic expectations and um, concerns regarding COVID, assessment of the government, etc. We also subjected respondents um, to information treatment in a randomized control trial um, where we tested four different treatments, uh, which I will um, explain in a minute, to basically test for two um, aspects. The first being is the framing of information uh, regarding COVID as uh, something which could be regarded as positive news or negative news is um, that relevant for consumer sentiment? And here we will exploit differences between those two countries. And secondly, is there um, a difference um, uh, regarding information treatments, which light one side of this trade-off between health policies and um, the economic uh, side effects of lockdown measures? Um, so why do we study Thailand and Vietnam? Well, um, those two countries are um, very interesting to compare because they are from the same region and uh, both emerging economies. So you might expect that they would be quite similar, but they're actually very different. Um, first, regarding uh, political uh, systems, there has been political unrest in Thailand in uh, the last decade. And uh, as we will see in our data, this results in a very high degree of um, um, discontent and distrust in the government, both during normal times, but also during the pandemic. Whereas we see a very high degree of political stability in Vietnam. And um, this is reflected in people generally agreeing, at least uh, in the survey, 
with uh, what the government is doing. What we also see is that even though uh, Vietnam is, is a much larger country in terms of inhabitants, there are significantly more COVID-19 cases in Thailand, both in absolute numbers, but also when uh, we um, then, of course, also per inhabitant. So um, in the last month, uh, we've seen this boost in papers on uh, COVID-19. Everybody's now um, busy working on this. So um, I'm, I'm going to skip over the literature. Just um, want to mention briefly that other authors have also been conducting surveys. And I think the, the second paper by Michael is going also going to be about a new uh, survey um, uh, regarding these issues. And uh, what the others have been finding, um, they're mostly on the US and uh, uh, surveys conducted in the very early phases of um, the pandemic. And typically people find that um, there is a large degree of um, uninformedness regarding um, the virus itself and then informing people about things like contagiousness. Uh, tends to um, make people more optimistic because they find out that they have been overestimating the threat of the virus. But on the other hand, uh, treating people with information about policy measures, as is done by uh, Kovio, Borutinchenko and Weber, um, finds that um, there is little or no effect on uh, spending or expectations here. So we will uh, relate to that as well. Okay, so our survey was run online. As I mentioned before, it was run in early May, uh, almost exactly at the same time in the two countries. We have slightly more respondents from Vietnam than uh, we were able to um, uh, attract in Thailand. And um, since our, our, uh, our sample is um, shifted towards the younger population, because typically younger younger respondents in those countries uh, have easier internet access compared to the older population. There's also some uh, non-representativeness regarding the urban and rural population or things like um, education. So we construct population weights in this case uh, only based on age, which is the main factor um, affecting the representativeness, but we also test for robustness of our results with more broader um, uh, uh, population weight also including things like urban, rural and um, education. Um, so just to give you a very brief uh, overview of the timeline and um, the number of cases in the two countries, you can see that in general those two countries compared to others weren't hit that much by the pandemic. So we have zero confirmed deaths in Vietnam at only 60. Uh, in Thailand up to end of June. Um, but you can also see the differences between the countries, even though Vietnam is the larger country, we have uh, nine times more cases in uh, Thailand. Other than that, the um, dynamics of the pandemic are pretty similar in the two countries. And then um, this red marked phase, here's the timing of our surveys. And this happened after the end of the partial lockdown in uh, Vietnam and during the first phase of easing of lockdown measures in Thailand. And this is also um, interesting because it's going to be one of our uh, kind of uh, identifying um, difference between the countries later on. That's um, the assessment of um, the government economic policy in general. So people are asked about assessing macroeconomic policy measures outside of COVID. And this question is asked before we uh, give any information treatments. And there you can see the general differences um, between the two countries because in Vietnam, which is the left hand side picture, um, the large majority of respondents, about 75%, answer that they think the government is doing a good job in general. We have only very few answering it's doing a poor job and uh, a couple, um, uh, something like 25% uh, or a bit less answer um, the government is doing a fair job. So that's the category in the middle. Whereas the picture looks a lot different in Thailand. Here we have um, 
the majority answering either that the government is doing a poor or a fair job and only very few people answer that it's doing a good job. So that's something to keep in mind. And um, this is also the same um, when we then ask after the treatments, we ask um, government um, assessment of government, also trust in the government and fighting the pandemic and different aspects of the pandemic. And we see a similar picture um, there as well. Now coming to our information treatments, uh, in total we have four different treatments and a control group. And um, the first two treatments um, are uh, taken from another survey, uh, which I uh, cited in the beginning, um, which asked uh, in a global survey, asked respondents to assess the response of the governments to the COVID-19 pandemic and also the response of the public. So there's this differentiation between the government and the public. And um, then uh, they show that in this global sample, uh, Thailand was the country where respondents gave the worst assessment to the government, whereas Vietnam was the country which gave the best assessment to their governments. So we show this picture to the respondents in, uh, in our survey in both countries, and then we give some uh, text, some explanation of what this picture means. And we, uh, the hypothesis would be that this is good news for a Vietnamese respondent because they can feel that their country is doing best among all those countries in the survey, whereas um, for a Thai respondent, this might be bad news because um, they could feel that their country is doing worst. And then from that same survey, um, regarding that second question about assessing the public reaction, here we phrase it a bit differently. Um, on average, Thai and Vietnamese respondents were uh, kind of in the middle of the country. So 50% of Thai respondents said that the public reaction was insufficient, but uh, there were countries like China, which had a respondent, which rated um, the public reaction at um, uh, only below 10% that's insufficient, whereas in India, almost everybody said that the public reaction was insufficient and similar in Vietnam. So in this case, um, the treatment would be similar in the two countries, and it would also be more neutral in terms of putting the, the country in, the, in between those two large economies um, in Asia. And um, the third and fourth treatment aims at highlighting two sides of this trade-off between health policy measures um, during the pandemic and the negative economic side effects. So we have a treatment citing an ILO forecast for global unemployment, which says that um, the forecast um, uh, is that unemployment is going to increase drastically in between 5 million or 25 million people globally in 2020. And then the tax is really quite dramatic. It talks about um, the increase in poverty, uh, a lot of people moving um, then towards um, poverty line and so on and so forth. So uh, also the, the words uh, of the treatment are, are really quite strong. And then we put as a comparison, uh, the increase in global unemployment in the financial crisis of 2008 and nine. Whereas um, the last treatment uh, in terms of wording, it's uh, more neutral. It just describes from um, a study that um, uh, the importance of social distancing so that if you um, uh, reduce your social contacts by 75%, you will in fact, um, uh, one, one infected person affects 2.5 people, whereas uh, under normal behavior, that could be 406 people in uh, 30 days. So before we uh, start uh, to go into the um, treatment um, effects, um, we want to check. Then I have, have to say you have two minutes. OK, thanks. Um, uh, first, we want to check for the unconditional uh, correlations with consumer sentiment. Um, and here we find uh, the correlations you would expect. So people become more optimistic um, if they expect uh, higher GDP growth, uh, less optimistic under higher expected unemployment. And also when they give a good assessment to the government in normal times, 
or if they trust more in the government in fighting the economic effects of COVID, um, they, they are also more optimistic, whereas they are less optimistic when they're, for instance, concerned that COVID could affect their personal financial situation. Um, and then the next thing we want to test is, does this, um, uh, in, in addition to this, do we have an effect of treatment, uh, the treatments we gave on consumer sentiments or on the regresses affecting consumer sentiment? And here we find there's very little treatment effect on consumer sentiment directly. There's only this um, a minor uh, effect was marginally significant of the public reaction treatment, the second one I just showed you, uh, for consumers in Vietnam. And it's similar for the regresses. We do find some treatment effects on, uh, in particular, unemployment expectations in Vietnam. So both the government reaction treatment and um, the public reaction treatment leads uh, Vietnamese respondents to become more optimistic regarding future unemployment. So they reduce unemployment expectations. So in that case, our initial hypothesis that this framing of the treatments would be uh, regarded as good news in Vietnam seems to be the case and also visible for uh, GDP expectations. But for instance, we find no effect on infl inflation expectations and also no effect in um, the Thai sample. Um, there's nothing there on the trust variables. So even though we do find that trusting the government in dealing with the COVID uh, um, crisis and the economic effects in particular has an impact on consumer sentiment, um, this is not affected by um, our information treatment at all. And then finally, for the concerns, that's personal concerns due to COVID-19. For these, we also find that um, they um, affect um, sentiment, in particular the personal finance concerns. And also here we find some effect from the first two treatments on the Vietnamese sample. So giving them these positively framed news um, reduces concerns uh, regarding the job security and um, the financial security um, due to COVID. So again, even though there's no direct effect on consumer sentiment, at least we have an effect here on, um, on a regressor uh, correlated with, with sentiment. And the last thing I want to show you before I conclude is um, a treatment effect on consumer sentiment conditional on this previous assessment of government policies, which I showed you in the very beginning. Remember, we asked that questions before we gave the treatments and it's not related to COVID, but it's related to assessing the government during normal times. And here we actually find that for the small group of Vietnamese uh, respondents, which are dissatisfied with um, the government policies during normal times, so they gave a poor assessment here, then treating them with a positively framed treatment of uh, gov the government reaction and compared to other countries from another survey uh, these people revise their consumer sentiment and become more optimistic after the treatment. Whereas on average, there's no significant effect for the rest of the group, which gave a fair or a good um, a response to begin with. So in effect, the treatment only becomes strong enough to uh, uh, warrant a, a reaction of consumer sentiment for the people which uh, didn't already have prior beliefs in line with the treatment. And uh, something similar seems to be happening also in Thailand, although here the Senate uh, errors are so large that uh, none of the effects are significant. So, uh, we find a similar um, reaction pattern also regarding the public reaction treatment. So even though this was phrased in a more neutral way, it still seems to be regarded as positive news by the Vietnamese um, respondents, whereas this is not the case for the Thai consumer. And finally, uh, for the last two treatments, um, there's this interesting uh, effect happening from the ILO forecast. Here we actually expected a much stronger reaction, but it turns out that only for those Vietnamese consumers, which prior to the treatment said the government during normal times was doing a fair job here, we see that these people become more pessimistic after um, getting this negatively phrased 
uh, treatment about um, future unemployment. So that's it. Um, let me conclude uh, very uh, quickly. Um, uh, uh, overall, from the treatment, even though we do not find a direct effect of the treatments on sentiment, there is some uh, um, evidence that um, the treatments um, which were regarded as good news did have an effect on macroeconomic expectations and on some concerns re uh, due to COVID-19. And then there is this indirect effect uh, via a prior assessment of the government during normal times that for those which had views or initial beliefs not in line with the treatment, um, we find that they do um, adjust also their consumer sentiment. And overall, um, there is uh, evidence that even after the end of the lockdown, uh, sentiment is still affected by concerns due to COVID and by trusting the government in dealing with COVID as well as the macro economic expectations so that we can affect, um, can expect some longer lasting effects on sentiment and spending even after um, strict lockdowns have ended. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you, Lena. What I will suggest, I will suggest we will keep the questions until the end as in the previous sessions as well, because that seems to be more uh, efficient and uh, uh, I would like now to, to start the second presentation but it looks like Michael uh, is, is not here it looks like there is a technical problem I don't understand what uh, what is happening so what I will do because by coincidence I am a co-author on this paper so I will start the presentation and hopefully Michael will uh, join uh, during during my presentation which is supposed to be his, his presentation. And um, I hope you can see the, the screen. Um, this is a um, similar research to, to what Lena has just presented. Um, I can therefore skip some of the motivation uh, because there is, so now I'm trying to, yes, it works. Um, um, there is quite a lot of interest towards the COVID shock and uh, uh, because, well, we can see it as a supply shock, as Michael Kötter uh, explained, this is a big economic uh, shock. Uh, we need to understand the implications on firm, for firms, for consumers. Michael Kötter was presenting implications for the banking sector, uh, which is also very important to understand. Um, and uh, in particular, what was very interesting to us is that uh, countries differently responded to that in terms of their policy, but also in terms of how they communicated the policy to consumers. So our idea was to continue our previous research on inflation expectations. Uh, we used the same technique um, uh, to, to, to apply it to the period of um, COVID. And uh, we uh, work with United Kingdom and United States consumers and we measure their um, uh, expectations and uh, perceptions of economic activity uh, before and after uh, policy announcements. That's the main idea of, of our research. Here a brief review, of, but obviously the literature on uh, COVID is growing. There are papers, already published papers, like this paper in Journal of Public Economics has been already published that measures economic uncertainty. So these are papers that uh, measure the um, economic impact of, um, of the coronavirus pandemic, pandemic. But also there are papers, and some of them Lena has just mentioned, paper by Carola Binder that was published in Review of Economics and Statistics. That very that is very close to what maybe we initially intended to do and what we did in in the previous years, measuring the impact of the monetary policy announcement on beliefs on consumers. And she had a very elegant approach there, because uh, it was not possible to apply the same methodology that we developed in our previous papers um, uh, to measure uh beliefs before the announcement and right after the announcement because this particular policy announcement during the COVID era were not scheduled so you don't know when it is going to happen and it just happened that fed announced everything right on a sunday so Car carola was fast enough to go 
and to design a survey and to launch it on Tuesday. But she embedded an information bit in the survey, and that was quite interesting. So that that gives the treatment effect, like what Lena was just reporting. You can measure what people report before they receive the information and what they believe after they receive the information. There is a very interesting paper published in the CPR collection of papers on risk attitudes and how. Uh, pandemic has in, has uh, affected risk and uncertainty attitudes in general population. For example, we observe, well, they observe that there is more pessimism and uh, less risk tolerance uh, in their population, which will be important for many studies. There is a close paper that uh, studies, um, uh, again, American consumers and uh, finds the effect of expectations and certainty. So COVID generates uncertainty about expectations and that has an impact uh, on uh, 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 consumption and savings decisions. And well, Lena has just presented her paper on that and there are also other papers on, this, on, on, on the same topic. So what's our idea? We take two countries, exactly like what Lena is doing, but our countries is United States and United Kingdom. Um, I think overall we have uh, about a couple of thousands of observations in each country. And there was a very interesting moment in spring. On the 16th of April, President Trump has announced the uh, Opening Up America Again plan, which was a very positive uh, message. And this very positive message we believe should have had an impact on uh, consumers. And in the United Kingdom, about the same time, uh, uh, Prime Minister Johnson announced that we are not going to finish the lockdown. And we believe that it was a, a negative message. So we have two messages. One of them is positive, one of them is negative. We were lucky enough to have measured inflation expect or ex expectations and perception just before this two announcement, two weeks before that, in the beginning of April, we uh, had our usual uh, wave of surveys and uh, we then measure what happens after those announcements. So we have a clear treatment effect and we have two countries and for those two countries we are uh, measuring, I'm sorry, we're measuring what is happening there. So I'm trying to, yeah, so that's um, the timeline. I just uh, skip the timeline. Uh, we use uh, Polfish. Polfish is an online survey provider which is uh, uh, used, well, we used it in previous papers so, as well, uh, which has a, a single important difference to other uh, uh, online providers. It works via mobile phones. So therefore questions should be very short and should fit into one mobile screen. I'll skip most of the details on, on Polfish. The first chart shows uh, uh, distributions of inflation expectations over the next 12 months and inflation perceptions over the past 12 months. So how do we perceive what was the inflation? And the blue and red lines show before and after the announcement. And remember that the announcements were also associated, or Michel has joined, but I, I will con just continue and you will correct me uh, where, 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 where I'm wrong. Um, uh, the policy announcement also contains some measures of support for the public and some information about the macroeconomic conditions. The blue and red lines, they show before and after the announcement. But as you see, there is no much difference and, uh, in, in either country. So the, the, the difference is really negligible. But when we control for the information that the participants have, uh, uh, whether they have heard about this policy announcement and whether they have not heard about the policy announcement, we see drastic differences in uh, expectations and perceptions. And those who are informed, they usually have more precise uh, uh, expectations and they, they, uh, they, they don't diverge from each other much in, 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 in the sample. The share of, fra the, the, the fraction of people who were informed about COVID about the pandemic was very high. The share of people who heard about the policy news, which is not reflected here, was about uh, 50 to 60 percent. It was not changing very much. This is a, a chart that shows uh, economic expectations. We didn't only measure the inflation expectations. We also asked them whether they perceived the economy was in a good shape or in a bad shape. And um, the, uh, the the again the red the red and blue that shows uh, uh, the 
the fraction or the number of responses corresponding to one is a, a good shape, if I remember well, and four is a bad shape in the economy, um, uh, before and after. And you can see the drastic difference between United Kingdom, which is down uh, the, the bottom left, and United States, which is the bottom right, after the, uh, uh, the, the prospects, what people think about the prospects of the country in the next 12 months. So that was a difference that we have observed. We haven't yet analyzed it, so I cannot tell you more about this. Uh, we also asked about um, uh, the uh, impact that people had. The impact is pretty similar. The impact in terms of finance, in terms of ability to pay, in terms of... Uh, uh, also, the last question was, we think that it is overrated, and maybe so this is the right column in each of the, the diagrams, you can see there is a little bit more people in the United States think that the problem is overrated, but generally distributions are quite similar one to another. Um, I will skip this slide because there is no much, much difference. I think this is the most recent that Michelle has produced today before joining us. Uh, this is the impact of being affected or being concerned with coronavirus on inflation expectations. This is something that Lena has also mentioned in, in her presentation. So if people are not affected, if they don't perceive, uh, and they, in their answer to our question, do you feel you are affected by coronavirus, if they uh, indicated they were not affected by coronavirus and they didn't have any relatives that would have been affected by the coronavirus, they usually have lower inflation expectations and lower assessment of, uh, uh, well, lower means better assessment of economic conditions in, um, in, in, in general. And I will just stop at this, at this table to, and, and let you reflect on that. So I've mentioned a paper that was studying the impact of coronavirus on, in, on uncertainty attitudes. I've mentioned a paper that was showing that coronavirus triggers a perception of higher uncertainty. And if we believe that pessimistic people would indicate a worse economic situation and higher inflation, then this result is very much consistent with what other researchers indicate to us, uh, that uh, if people are affected, if they see that the severity of the corona crisis, their perceived situation is more uncertain, they act more pessimistically, and as a result, they would give a higher inflation expectation and perception and would assess that the economic condition is not in a very good shape. I shall stop here and I have to give the floor to the next speaker, but Michael is here now. And if there are any questions, I would ask you to ask the questions in chat and then probably there will be, hopefully there will be time in the end of the session to discuss it. Thank you. And the next speaker, is uh, Laura. I know that Laura was here. Yes. Hello. You, yes, we can see you. you. You can share your screen. Yeah, it works. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, this is a, a work that uh, we done with uh, Fernando Borras at the Central Bank of Uruguay. And it's about inflation expectations, in particular uh, about overconfidence, uncertainty, and inflation forecast errors. The, um, they usually disclaim applies that this, uh, the opinions here are uh, those of, of the authors and not do not uh, reflect the position of the central bank. So uh, in, in summary, this paper uses a, a rich data set that we have, uh, that is uh, performed by the central bank and the, the Office of Statistics in Uruguay. And that uh, has uh, not only inflation point forecast, but uh, it also has the subjective probability distribution that the firms uh, gives us and this allows us to compare the uncertainty that is the extante variance with the exposed variance or, or the, um, the mean square prediction errors that the, the firms uh, make. Uh, well, our, our 
our results show that uh, we find that forecasters are overconfident and I, I will define this concept later. That means that uh, the ex the variance of inflation is lower than the, the forecaster errors. So the forecasters provided confidence intervals that were too narrow. And uh, later we ask if overconfidence uh, can be explained by uh, some uh, behavior like the, the rounding behavior or the uh, some particular uh, characteristic that we found that is the inconsistent, the, the internal consistency of the forecast. And we find that uh, even excluding the inconsistent predictors or the, the people, the, the firms that ground their answers, the uncertainty is still lower than the forecaster errors. So, so we conclude that overconfidence is a characteristic feature of our uh, sample of firms. Uh, about the motivation, uh, the economic theory has uh, clearly established the role of uncertainty uh, when making economic decisions, and that happens uh, with consumers and with investors, and with uh, our focus is uh, in the firms that are the ones that uh, establish that fixed prices. Uh, so. Uh, despite the relevance of, the, of, of these empirical measurements of uncertainty, as stated by Binder in, in her work in, of 2017, uh, these measures are scarce. And the evidence shows that uh, the greater uncertainty about evolution of prices that uh, the, the firms face is translated then uh, into uh, a more a bigger volatility of prices so uh, focuses on that and understanding the process of uh, of the generation of expectations by the firms is of great interest and most of all for for the central banks uh, well in the recent years the idea of focusing on the probabilistic questions more than the point predictions has been gaining ground and we have uh, some interesting papers of Mansky and, and also from Engelberg and others. And well, uh, our objective is to test if uh, Uruguayan companies that have less, less extant variance in their inflation projections then uh, perform uh, worse in terms of the prediction errors of their forecasts. Well, what we do uh, in our first stage, we study the level and evolution of inflation uncertainty for the firms in Uruguay in the period 2014-2018. Um, we take the definition of Mansky to approximate a measure of uncertainty we estimate the variance through uh, the subjective probability distribution functions that we uh, have from the, our survey. In a second stage, we uh, want to know if there is a relationship between the uncertainty that the agents have ex ante and the prediction errors they make. So this uh, allows us to perform a test of overconfidence. And finally, we analyze and quantify how uh, the uh, overconfidence, how this behavior is affected by two characteristics uh, that we already found in, uh, in other studies, like the internal inconsistency and the rounding behavior of the respondents. Well, I, our, dat, our data is a, a monthly survey of firms that is uh, it's very rich, it's a, a very uh, unique source of data uh, that is uh, a sample representative of all economic sectors except for the agricultural, financial and the public sector. It's been performed since October 2009 uh, and uh, we have uh, a panel data 
but we only have uh, eight waves till now when uh, we have the probabilistic question because the probabilistic question was a formula that was applied in eight times from August 2014 to September 2018. Uh, well, and what we know about this uh, formula is that firms correctly answer subjective probability questions uh, because as, except for the first time of being implemented that the, the answers were wrong in some cases and we have to to um, to make a follow with them uh, by phone in all ways the answers add up to 100 percent and this is an example of a formula uh, from march 2016 where the question was, uh, what do you think are the chances that the following will happen with inflation in the next 12 months? And we gave them, in this time, we gave them eight intervals. Uh, inflation less than 0%, from 0 to 3, from 3 to 5, 5 to 7, 7 to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 15, and higher than 15. Well, to give a brief introduction of overconfidence, uh, I'm going to quote uh, two prominent science uh, uh, economists uh, of the comportmental, of the behavioral economists, that are Devon and Tyler, that say perhaps, perhaps the most robust finding in the psychology of judgment is that people are overconfident. So this phenomenon has been studied for decades, mostly by the psychologists. And uh, the question is how this affect uh, the, the economic decisions that Asians uh, make. And we want to focus on one of the varieties of overconfidence, that is overprecision. This means that uh, the individual have uh, are to uh, have to certainty regarding the accuracy of their beliefs. So uh, on average, maybe they, they, they have accurate economic beliefs, but they underestimate the variance of the possible outcome. So um, they don't assess correctly the risks. In practical, we say a forecaster is overconfident when their ex-ante variance of inflation is lower than the exposed forecaster errors. So they provided two narrow confidence intervals. That means in, in our sample that they give a probability uh, greater than zero in, in two uh, little uh, intervals. And uh, their forecaster errors are much uh, bigger. So um, Laura, Laura, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you, but may, may I say that you have not more than four minutes from now? Okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to explain how we measure, how we estimate the uncertainty. An advantage of this, uh, of this kind of survey is that we have the probability, the subjective probability distribution, and we can estimate an individual measure of uncertainty. So we compute the mean of the distribution with the probability that each firm uh, gives uh, uh, multiplied by the midpoint of the interval. Then we compute the variance uh, as usual. This is the, the midpoint of the interval and this is the mean of the forecast probability distribution. And this, this sigma uh, can be read as an indicator of the forecaster uncertainty at the individual level. As, at the aggregate, uh, as an aggregate level, we follow Glass and Hartman and we compute the average of the individual variance. And it's interesting to see that at the aggregate level, uh, although in Uruguay the inflation fall, we didn't see that uh, 
translate into a decrease in uncertainty. Uh, then we compute the variance misalignment ratio. For this, we consider the individual prediction errors. We compute the mean square error. And, uh, and we compute the, uh, the individual ex ante uncertainty as uh, an average of the errors of the the uh, variance of uh, of each time of the survey so the ratio is between the mean square error and the uncertainty at an individual level and that is a average between all the respondents if the variance misalignment ratio is greater than one we find evidence of overconfidence Uh, well, we study also consistency and rounding to see is, if that conducts affect our confidence. Um, I don't know if I have time to explain this, but I'm going to the results. Uh, so we see that rounding is uh, the, the practice of rounding in, while giving a, a response uh, is widespread in Uruguayan firms. Most of all, rounding at a level of 5% uh, is 91% on average across all sample individuals. This is the, the, the sky blue uh, bar. And when we see the prediction errors, uh, the, the green line is the mean square error of the people who don't round and uh, gives consistent responses. So we see that if we exclude the, the people who round and the inconsistent uh, responses, we have a less a mean square error in our sample. Well, I'm going to go to the conclusion. So we find that the uh, ex ante variance of inflation is lower than the exposed forecaster errors. So we conclude that forecasters are oversized because they provide confidence intervals that are too narrow. Uh, we find also that overconfidence cannot be explained by inconsistent or rounder forecaster because if we exclude that firms from our sample, we still find uh, that the ratio is uh, greater than one. So these results make us question how we measure inflation expectations and uncertainty and if there is room for uh, improvement in this area. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Also, thank you very much for being very, st to, for, for sticking, sticking to the time. Uh, I understand that you've skipped quite a large <laughs> chunk of your presentation, uh, but, uh, but people, people, uh, well, everyone, uh, participants are invited to, to send questions in the chat window and uh, maybe uh, possibly later contacting by email. I have requested that the closing remarks, they will start five minutes later so that we have enough time to, for, for our last presentation and Rudra Prasad Roy will present um, his paper on measuring forecasting inflation as well. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can you uh, see my presentation? Yes, we can see the presentation and yourself. Thank you. So, uh, as you can see, the title of the presentation, uh, the title of the paper is Forecasting Indian Inflation Using Commodity Future Prices, The Role of Asymmetries and Structural Breaks. And this is written with uh, Professor Saikat Sunurai from Jadapur University, Kolkata. So, uh, the uh, there are basic three objectives of our paper. So firstly, we want to check uh, whether augmenting traditional Phillips curve uh, model with inclusion of crude oil prices can produce better inflation focus for Indian economy or not. Secondly, we want to check whether augmenting traditional Phillips curve type model with inclusion of commodity futures prices can produce better inflation focus or not. And lastly, we want to check whether it is important uh, to include structural breaks and asymmetric price changes when uh, we are modeling inflation in India. 
so uh, as we all know that more and more economies uh, uh, have uh, adopted inflation forecasting and when uh, economies are doing inflation forecasting it is important to uh, you know uh, forecast inflation uh, uh, you know uh, in sorry inflation targeting it is important to uh, forecast inflation properly and uh, you know when uh, we are uh, going to forecast inflation it is very important to find out uh, the key determinants of inflation now one such determinant uh, is uh, found to be commodity futures prices there are many uh, you know studies uh, which have found the relationship between commodity futures prices as and output or commodity future prices and inflation now uh, it is argued that since these uh, commodities are uh, you know traded in auction markets uh, they basically signals uh, you know about the future economic uh, condition so uh, that that is how this can uh, be used as a leading indicator of inflation now uh, there is this paper by shocking and ziang where uh, you know using a theoretical model they have uh, found that there are basically two uh, effects of commodity future prices on inflation one effect is the cost effect and the other effect is the informational uh, effect so the cost effect is always uh, of negative sign and the informational effect is always of positive sign then the you know the effect of commodity future prices on inflation is ambiguous in the sense that if we find that the cost effect is stronger than the informational effect then there may be negative um, uh, relationship between commodity future prices and inflation and if we find that the informational effect is stronger than the uh, uh, cost effect then there can be positive uh, relationship between commodity future prices and uh, inflation now uh, uh, there are many studies uh, uh, you know uh, recently uh, which have uh, you know tried to uh, forecast inflation using commodity future prices and uh, these studies are mainly for uh, you know developed countries and some studies are there for uh, you know the developing countries or uh, emerging market economies and uh, and the skipping this part so uh, let me uh, very briefly uh, discuss uh, the inflation trajectory in india so inflation in india you know is uh, found to evolve uh, through many phases and these phases are basically phases of uh, you know monetary policy in india so as you can see that uh, in india in the post independence period monetary policy is found to uh, 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 you know pass through four uh, phases uh, like control expansion monetary uh, targeting multiple indicator uh, approach and lastly in august uh, 2016 we have adopted uh, what is called flexible inflation targeting so now when we are practicing inflation targeting it is very important to forecast uh, you know uh, inflation now we have gone through the monetary policy committee reports and we have found that uh, in india the monetary policy committee is looking uh, you know uh, looking uh, into the movements of oil prices on and uh, world commodity future prices but here we propose that we should also look into the movement of uh, you know domestic commodity futures uh, future prices uh, so as to predict inflation properly so this graph basically shows you know the consumer price inflation or retail inflation trajectory in india so as you can see that you know uh, uh, in the last uh, 10 13 years it has you know gone through many phases so these are the structural breaks uh, that you can see from the graph so from this uh, graph as well as from the previous slide it is uh, it is it, it it can be said that when we are modeling inflation in india it is very important to include structural breaks but in the literature we have found that some studies although some studies have you know included structural breaks while uh, modeling inflation some some other studies haven't done so now uh, in terms of methodology we have used this uh, feasible quasi uh, generalized least square technique now the question is uh, that why we are using feasible quasi generalized least square technique now uh, th this method has been proposed uh, by westland and narain in 2012 and later on they have uh, modified their technique in 2015 and the paper came out in journal of uh, financial econometrics in 2015 so uh, they argue that when uh, you know modeling uh, inflation or when modeling 
asset prices uh, or uh, you know some variable with very high frequency data it is uh, very natural to have problem of uh, con uh, conditional heteroscedasticity or problem of autocorrelation or persistence and problem of endogeneity now when we are modeling inflation in india now there can be problem of autocorrelation there can be problem of heteroscedasticity and especially when we are considering you know predictors like uh, you know commodity future prices when modeling um, inflation along with output there can be problem of endogeneity so if we have these three problems in our case then it is appropriate or it will be appropriate to use uh, you know fqgls type technique now let me very briefly tell you about this fqgls technique so this is the basic model where we are regressing inflation on its predictors or the past value of the predictors now we want to test whether this beta is equal to zero or not this is the predictability test now while being so we we uh, may face the problem of uh, persistence or problem of autocorrelation this predictor variable can follow uh, any autoregressive process then there can be problem of endogeneity and there is a test of endogeneity uh, proposed by western and Narayan. we have used that that test to check whether there is endogeneity or not so what we have done uh, from the first equation we have we have derived the uh, you know error term and from the uh, second equation that is the equation of the predictor variable we have also derived the uh, error term then we regress the error term of the predicted variable on the error term of the predictor variable and we check whether this gamma is equal to zero or not and if we find that this gamma is not equal to zero and statistically significant then we can see that there is problem of endogeneity then uh, uh, there can be problem of heteroscedasticity as well and then the best possible way to uh, you know uh, to to uh, tackle heteroscedasticity is to use the generalized least square technique so here also we have used the generalized least square technique and that's why this model is called the fq gls technique gls technique has been used and what we have done we have estimated the arch model and from the arch model we have estimated the variance series and then one upon that variance has been used as the weights so that is the, the you know usual technique so now obvious question is that why we are using the arch model we can we we could have used gauch model or e gauch model so we have also uh, checked in uh, instead of arch uh, uh, model if we estimate the e gauch model or ga simple gauch model then even our results uh, you know do not change so now we estimate uh, these five models. Uh, the first model is when we are regressing our inflation on output. So this is the traditional Phillips curve type model. In the second model, uh, the first one is basically the demand side uh, Phillips curve model. The second model we are regressing inflation on oil prices. So this is this is kind of uh, you know supply side model, supply side uh, Phillips curve type model. In the third model, we are we are regressing. Uh, you know, inflation on commodity future prices in the fourth model, which is the augmented Phillips curve type model, we are considering both output as well as oil prices. And in the fifth model, we are considering output as well as commodity future prices. So the fourth model and fifth model are called the augmented Phillips curve model. Our, our proposed model is the fifth model where we are using both output as well as commodity future prices. Now these uh, models are in terms of symmetric price changes. Instead, what we can do, we can use asymmetric price changes. Asymmetric price changes, uh, in, in case of asymmetric price changes, we need to decompose the price or uh, it may be the oil price or it may be the commodity future price in the, its positive series as well as negative series. That means we have to you know, segregate the positive uh, changes in commodity future prices and negative changes in the commodity future prices actually this 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 thing has been uh, you know done by sheen uh, uh, in their nardl model so we have used the same technique here and we have incorporated this into our uh, this fqgls technique to to check uh, you know the asymmetric uh, uh, effect of commodity future price changes on inflation so these are the four models where we have considered the asymmetric uh, price changes in the first model we have considered asymmetric uh, oil price changes so this is the traditional uh, you know supply side phillips cup type model the only thing we have done is uh, instead of symmetric price changes we have used asymmetric price changes in the second model this is uh, again the supply side type phillips cup model where we have used asymmetric uh, commodity future price changes 
In the third model, this is the augmented Phillips curve uh, type model where we have used uh, output as well as asymmetric oil price changes. And in the fourth model, we have used output as well as asymmetric commodity future uh, price uh, changes. So again, here, the fourth model is our proposed model. So we will we will check the uh, the you know uh, performance of this four mod model vis uh, fourth model vis a vis other uh, you know three models. Uh, now uh, in terms of data, we have used this uh, year on year inflation data, and uh, for the purpose of forecasting, we have used three horizons: uh, the you know uh, very short term horizon of three months, where mid uh, short term horizon of twelve months, and medium term horizon of 24 months this is this is in line with the practice of reserve bank of india they uh, also use now casting short term projections and 12 uh, of 12 months and medium term projection of the 24 months so in the same line we have considered h is equal to 3 h is equal to 12 and h is equal to 24 so our uh, time period is from june 2006 till uh, you know uh, june 2019 so we have started our sample from June 2006 because from this time period, the commodity future price index um, uh, are available. Dot data on, on on the commodity future price index are available. So these are the data sources we have used the commodity future price index from the multi commodity exchange, which is the largest commodity uh, exchange in India. Okay, now uh, let me show you the results. Uh, so this is the results from the serial auto correlation, uh, serial correlation test and heteroscedasticity test. So from this table, you can see that uh, you know uh, for all of our variable there is auto correlation as well as heteroscedasticity. Next, we we check for uh, presence of endogeneity and presence of persistence. So from this uh, table also, you can see that uh, you know the persistence test statistics are significant and positive. So there, there, there is problem of persistence. But in terms of endogeneity, we can see that there is uh, uh, we do not find any problem of endogeneity. This is when we use inflation as our predicted variable. But we have checked if we instead of inflation we uh, use the CPI variable as our predicted variable, then there is problem of endogeneity. Now since we have this problem of autocorrelation, heteroscedasticity, persistence, and endogeneity, then uh, we can safely use the FQGLS technique now let me show you the results of the predictability test this is uh, you know uh, uh, from the models where we we uh, do not use structural breaks so the first part of the table shows the uh, results of the uh, results when we use so symmetric price here yeah, i just want to mention you have 2 minutes left thank you okay sure so uh, here uh, the results show the symmetric price changes as well as uh, you know without structural breaks the second part shows the asymmetric price changes as well as structural breaks so as you can see in the fifth model our proposed model these uh, you know asymmetric price changes this these terms uh, turned out to be significant so we can we can see that uh, we can safely use this uh, you know augmented phillips cup type model to predict uh, inflation in india so this is the case when we use uh, you know structural breaks along with uh, asymmetric price changes again we find that uh, you know these uh, coefficients are uh, significant so we we again can see that we can use this augmented phillips cup type model to uh, forecast indian inflation now let me show you uh, very quickly the uh, forecasting results so in case of in sample forecast we we see that in the model where we use uh, both structural breaks as well as asymmetric price changes the you know the root mean square error is the minimum so uh, th this is the case even if you go for out of sample forecast of uh, three months horizon 12 month horizon and 24 month horizon so from this table we can we can we can say that uh, you know the models models which are considering structural base as well as uh, asymmetric price changes are best in terms of forecasting now uh, what we have done we have check the unbiasedness of the forecast uh, models and also we have uh, checked the performance of the uh, you know forecast model in terms of three statistics i'm coming to that so very quickly uh, let me show you the results of the unbiasedness so in in, in uh, this case we have found that all our models are unbiased so in terms of unbiasedness we cannot uh, you know uh, prefer one model over another then let me go to the uh, forecasting test. Yes, we have done this uh, Campbell Thompson test. Then we have done this Diebold and Marino test. And we have also done this Clark and West test. And we have evaluated our uh, the forecast 
being performance of our models in terms of these three tests. So this is the in-sample uh, forecasting performance. So as you can see that model five, our proposed model uh, can perform uh, uh, better than any of these restricted models in terms of all three statistics, the city statistics, the DM statistics and CW statistics. The, this is the case uh, when we consider the symmetric price changes or we consider the asymmetric price changes. So we can we can see that uh, you know forecasting uh, uh, you know using this uh, augmented Phillips of type model is the best. Then this is the case even if we uh, you know go for out of sample forecast of three months horizon, twelve month horizon, or twenty four months horizon. So let me very quickly summarize our results. So what we have found. So we have found that uh, you know. Tradi traditional Phillips curve type model can be augmented by in introducing supply side uh, factors such as crude oil prices or uh, domestic commodity futures prices. Then uh, it is important to you know control for persistence, endogeneity, and heteroskedasticity when we are modeling uh, inflation. Then uh, it is important to consider the asymmetric price changes uh, along with uh, considering structural breaks when when uh, we are forecasting uh, inflation. Then uh, in Indian case, we have uh, found that uh, augmented Phillips cup type model have outperformed the traditional Phillips cup type model and other models, uh, other models in terms of forecasting performance, forecasting uh, performance. And uh, we have also found that the commodity future price based augmented Phillips cup model performs better than the crude oil price uh, based augmented Phillips cup model. So uh, we can we can see that you know, while uh, forecasting or modeling, um, you know, inflation in India, it is important to consider domestic future uh, uh, prices, domestic commodity future prices, along with considering structural breaks as well as asymmetric price changes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have now the pleasure of uh, taking over the session chair and doing the best part of being a session chair to conclude the session. So thank you very much uh, for the presenters. Thank you very much to you as the participants. And now I invite you to join stream A for the concluding remarks and open questions uh, presented uh, by Tatiana. Thank you so much and bye for now. Thank you.